Tonight's speaker is Dr. Tom Lento, who comes to us from Facebook, right? And where he works as a data scientist. Now, I don't need to tell you how successful Facebook is. The fact that I don't need to tell you is an indication of how successful Facebook is and how much it is changing the landscape for communication and technology and information. So Facebook has, I have here over 800 million users. Somebody told me tonight it's 900 million users. It's become a central feature of many people's everyday lives. Facebook has importance in our interpersonal, our social, and our professional relationships, right? It shapes, we share information, we organize events, we develop um, relationships, we kind of get people to understand about causes, we share news, all of these things we do through our social media. As a researcher at Facebook, Dr. Lento analyzes user behavior and helps inform product design. He works as part of a team, and his talk tonight is on understanding a global network. In his talk, he's going to have three different segments, and we'll intersperse with sort of Q&A throughout, so you can ask him some questions about the different pieces of his talk. He's going to talk about both how the research is done and some of the implications for um, interaction and sort of social media. So I met Tom a few years ago when he was doing his PhD in sociology at Cornell University. Tom was part of an interdisciplinary group of scholars whose research addressed key questions about social media, social networks, and information diffusion. Now, Tom has traveled all around the world in lots of different places, but I learned today this is his first time ever in Ohio. So let's give a warm Ohio welcome to Dr. Tom Lento. Thank you, Laura, and thanks everybody for, for having me here. So, as Laura said, you know, this is a talk about understanding a global network. It's in some sense a little bit, um, it's a little bit of, a, of an advertisement for my own team and for the people who do, do some of the great work that, that we do. We do a lot of interesting research projects, and what, what I'll do is cover three of them that highlight both the kinds of things that we can learn by studying social media service, particularly one at the scale of Facebook, uh, some of the challenges of studying user behavior at Facebook scale, and finally, highlight some of the strengths of mixed methods approaches and why it's useful to look at research problems and problems in general using a variety of different tactics and techniques that, that will tell us some slightly different things. So before I start, the, the part of the, uh, and apparently this slide is now out of date, but the, uh, the part of the technical challenges mostly has to do with scale for the time being. And, uh, just to give you some idea of the scale, we have over 800 million or over 900 million users worldwide. That's monthly active users. Over half of them log in on any given day, which means that we're dealing with four or 500 million people logging in using Facebook to upload photos, talk to their friends, and communicate every single day. Um, our friend graph, which is you know, the number of, of uh, links between people, is over 100 billion edges. And what you see here is a map of the world as illustrated by Facebook friend links. And the thing that I really like about this map is that there is not actually a map on this slide. Uh, what you're seeing are edges between people based on geolocation, illustrated as points of light on a black background. And when you get high enough resolution, this gives you a nice little heat map effect, and you can actually see where the Facebook population is densest. And when you have everything here, and this is some fractional sample of all of our friend edges, but when you have a large enough random sample of Facebook friend edges, you can draw most of the world. Uh, we don't have the whole world on the map, but we've got, we've got a lot of it. Now, these people are not just showing up and doing nothing. They are actually contributing content. They're uploading photos. Over 250 million photos are uploaded a day. We get over 2 billion likes and comments every day. Uh, what this means is that when you want to do behavioral analysis, you need to be able to process a lot of data. The site is constantly changing. The user base is constantly changing. The, kinds of data that we have to look at are, are growing and changing all the time as new features are launched. Um, to give you one kind of idea of this is the size of Facebook's Hadoop cluster. If you don't know what Hadoop is, that's okay. This is basically a data storage system that we use, and most of our analytics are driven by the data that's stored within this system. And it's not actually at zero in 2008, but it was in the you know, one petabyte range. And it grew very quickly to 50 petabytes. And to give you an idea of what a petabyte is, for those of you who are not in the computer science realm and conversant in all these prefixes, it goes giga, tera, and peta. So a petabyte is 1 million gigabytes. And what that means is if this laptop were our Hadoop cluster, I would need like a quarter of a million of them in order to store that much data, just to store it. Um, so we have a lot of data. It's pretty hard to process. We have special tools, special infrastructure to process it. We also write custom code to process it. So if 
you watch this presentation, you think, boy, I'd really like to do this kind of research. If you are not a computer scientist, I strongly suggest that you learn how to write code. If you are a computer scientist, I strongly suggest that you learn social science uh, because you, you need both to be able to, to put all this stuff together. OK, so that's enough of kind of the big numbers. The richness of our data allows us to answer questions that have previously been not inaccessible, but exceedingly difficult for social scientists to answer. And some of these are actually very basic questions in the social sciences, like this one here. How does information spread? So going all the way back to the early 1900s, there have been some great studies about the diffusion of information, the diffusion of innovations. James Coleman looked at the diffusion of a medical innovation in a community of physicians. Uh, Everett Rogers looked at the diffusion of hybrid corn plants amongst farmers in the Midwest. These are fairly old studies. They're done on fairly small sets of data, and they're fairly limited in scope just because it's so hard to collect information about who people know and where they learned about something from. Well, on Facebook, we have the advantage that we actually have a pretty good map of people's social graph, and we have logs that tell us when people actually learned about something, when we first showed it to them. Now, that's not quite the same as when they really first learned about something, but at least we know when they first learned about something on Facebook. Now, why do we care about this question for Facebook purposes? Uh, it's important for advertisers to understand. It's important for our sales and marketing teams to be able to explain to people what the value proposition of Facebook is. It's also important for our product developers and designers as they're building tools like the newsfeed to help them understand how information propagates through the network, how people are getting their information from, via Facebook from their friends. It's also important for security purposes. If there's some kind of spammer or some kind of an attacker, they can understand how information spreads and be able to respond appropriately in order to build better automated systems to cut down on, on potential abuse. <laughs> so for this particular study, yes, Eric named it Gesundheit, uh, Modeling Contagion in the Facebook News Feed. And so this was done by Eric Sun, who is one of our data scientists on the entities team and myself and a couple of others. And we presented at the International Conference of Web Logging and Social Media a few years back. What we were interested in was contagion. Uh, and, there was, and part of the reason we were interested in contagion is because it was inherently interesting to us. And partly it was because there was a little bit of an argument between the popular press and the scientific community. Uh, the popular press was talking about how ideas spread, and they spread through these kind of influentials. And this was, in some sense, popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in his book, The Tipping Point. And the notion of this was essentially that there's some magical person who has a particular set of attributes that if you get that person to really like your product and to talk about it, then that person will pass that information on and it will cascade through the entire network and everybody will find out about it. And there are all these kind of marvelous examples of, of the sort of the patient zero of, of the epidemic. The other side of the argument is, Dun is primarily driven by Duncan Watts and his research group that was at Yahoo Research at the time, um, that ideas aren't distributed through a graph because there's one person with a magical location and all these magical properties, and then you find that person, and that person goes and gets everybody to uh, believe in something or gets everybody to pay attention to something. What actually happens is that you can find these people after the fact, but the reason you find them and the reason that they're there is not because they are so special, but because everybody around them was already susceptible to the idea. And they essentially brought it in. And so ideas are more like viruses. It's not something that's being actively transmitted and pushed by one or two special people. It's something that's being transmitted from person to person more like a disease. Um, but you know, some of these diseases, fortunately, are, are positive. They're not all virulent. right? So Watts has these models that suggest that their observation is correct. But Gladwell is building a story based on a lot of research that, that ties into his, his theory. And so we wanted to know, OK, well, what, you know, which one is right? Um, and also, what kind of assumptions are they making? And can we test those assumptions? So one assumption that they make is that ideas, these cascades of ideas through networks, are started by one or two or a very small number of individuals. And we didn't actually know if that was true. We wanted to examine that. We also wanted to understand a little bit of a puzzle in our own data. So there's, there was some research earlier that showed that ideas and cascades, diffusion cascades, tend to go through very short chains of people, that you get like three or four people. If you come up with something maybe two or three hops down the line, it'll sort of end. But what we were seeing were much longer chains of diffusion within our, within our product. And we weren't sure if that was particular to our product or if it was just a fluke of the particular small sample of data we were looking at. We wanted to investigate that in a little bit more detail. Uh, and of course, we then decided to use demographic and behavioral characteristics to see if we could predict the length of these diffusion chains and figure out uh, 
you know, is there, is there any way that we can show that there's evidence of being able to find these influential people that Gladwell posits in his theory? So the way that we decided to do this was by looking at our newsfeed. And this is a, a very old screenshot of the newsfeed. It was current as of about the time that, uh, that we published this paper. And you can see in here that there are some stories and there are some comments and, and other things. But the main distribution mechanism in Facebook is, in fact, the newsfeed. If I take an action, my friends will see it in their feeds. And here you can see I've taken this action. I am a fan of the Ithaca Beer Company, which is the local brewery in, in Ithaca, New York, where I went to school. What we decided to do was to focus on these page fan actions. They're no longer called fan actions. You now like pages. But in 2009, as you can see from the text up here, it became a fan. I'll try to use the, the current term as much as possible, but, um, but sometimes I slip up. And what we did essentially was to take a look and we, at, at how the liking of these pages spread through the feed from one user to another. Now, at the time, there weren't really ad units where you could buy ads to get people to like your page. The primary mechanism for, um, for affiliating yourself with a page like this was actually through the feed. So how did this work? Well, we built a graph of all of these uh, page liking chains. And it looks like this. So if Alex like, or Alice likes a page, that action will show up in the news feeds of her friends. If Bob sees that action in his feed, and Bob subsequently likes the page within the next day or so, then we create a chain between Alice and Bob of length one that Bob inherited this, this piece of information from Alice. That's where, that's where Bob found out about it. And the same thing for Charlie. So now you can see that Alice is the parent of two chains of length one. Okay? If we add Diane to the bottom and Diane saw Charlie's newsfeed story, then it becomes a chain of length two from Alice through Charlie to Diane. If Diane saw stories from both Charlie and Bob, then both of them are her parents because we can't actually distinguish. We can't really assign credit and say, we know that that Diane likes Charlie better than Bob, or we know that Diane only saw Charlie's story. We, we showed them both. We don't know which one she necessarily paid attention to. And so we assign credit in both cases. Any questions so far? Feel free to interrupt at any point. Yeah. So what we did was we uh, split the study into two parts. And the main data set was page level data to try to understand how these chains grew. Um, how these cascades actually happened. And so the first data set was a look at all user page connections for about 250,000 pages. We looked at all of the connections that happened within a six month period in early 2008. The actual research was done over at the end of the summer. And so we kind of took whatever was most current at that time. And that was our main data set. It was essentially this gigantic network of user affiliations with pages and the, uh, the ordering in which they occurred. Our secondary data set was to take 10 random representative pages with some modifications to make sure that we had enough, enough users who were interacting with these things and see if we could predict the length of the chains that users would start in these pages and see if we could find any, any metrics that were consistent predictors across all of these page cases um, to show that you know, maybe there's some characteristics that we can use to predict who are the most influential people in this process. And what I'll do is I'll just summarize some of the high-level results and then go into the regression model in a little bit more detail. I'm still going to keep it pretty high-level, but the numbers will be on screen. If, if you like reading regression output, then you can read it. If not, you can just listen to me, and, and uh, hopefully it will, make, it will all make sense and, and you'll be able to understand me. But the first thing is a little bit more, more visual. So remember here, and this, this is a picture of one of, the, uh, one of the pages, the graph that we constructed for one of the pages. And this one is for Stripey, which is a cartoon character that was popular kind of in uh, Slovenia, Bosnia, and Croatia, apparently, and I think some, other, some of the other countries around there, but, but primarily these three nations. Um, and you can see, I don't think it shows up very well, but this, this kind of green block here that's disconnected, that's Croatia, and then you have yellow and blue as uh, Slovenia and Bosnia, respectively. Now remember, each line, so each of these little dots is a node, and each line connecting these, these nodes is a link that shows that one person saw the story in the newsfeed and then liked the page as a, after that story within a 24-hour timeout window. And what you see when you look at this, and this is kind of an illustration of the danger of looking at pictures like this and trying to draw a lot of inferences. You look, you say, oh, I know who the influential is. It's this guy right here. There's one person who's connecting these two otherwise largely disconnected globes. And so you might look at that and think, oh, well, that person must be really important in this graph. But it turns out that that was one of the last people 
to become a fan of the page or to like the page in our data set. So clearly, this was not the person who drove the, the diffusion. Um, you know, and so now you look at these kind of clouds of people, and it's hard to kind of pick one out visually. So we, we tried to use some, some metrics to, the, to measure these things a little bit later. But essentially, you need to know the temporal ordering in order to understand diffusion. You need to have a lot of granularity in the data, because if you just look at a plain snapshot map after the fact, it's very difficult to determine who's really important based on any of the standard network metrics that we might want to use. So when we dug into the numbers a little bit, we discovered one interesting thing. Our first question was whether or not it was valid to assume that these cascades were started by a small number of people. And it turns out the answer is not really, um, at least not in the Facebook context for liking pages and page, page liking being spread through the news feed. Roughly 15% of the users in the biggest cluster uh, started. They didn't see the page in their feed within that 24-hour window. Now, you might say, well, that's an artifact of your 24-hour threshold, but we tried a few different windows. It didn't really seem to change. 15% was pretty stable. And the larger the network got, the more it converged to that number. Um, what this means, essentially, is that a lot of people are finding out about this from other means. Now, it might be just that they didn't see it in their feed, but they heard about it from me, and it's the same thing, and we're simply not able to measure it. Because if I tell you that I like this page, and you should go on Facebook and like it too, we might not ever see the story, the story transfer, but there's still a clear diffusion process going on there. So our data is clearly not perfect. Uh, but at the same time, this number is, is really pretty big, and, all, and it just suggests that people are finding out about things from other mechanisms. Uh, as one example, Nastia Lukin was the Olympic gymnast, and this was the Summer Olympics going on right around this time, and her page exploded all of a sudden. Right? Her page did not explode because a bunch of people liked it and saw it in their feeds. Her page exploded because she won a gold medal in the Olympics and people became a fan of her. Right? So you can see that there are a lot of kind of external processes that might make it look like you have a really huge diffusion event, but in fact it's some kind of an external event, some kind of mass media driven exposure. And this ties in very much with, with Watts' side of the argument that you know, it isn't that there's one person that you need to reach, it's that you need to reach enough people to then start a bunch of these chains. Uh, and that's kind of our second point, that a lot of these kind of clusters were formed as many very short diffusion chains merged. Now, we had longer diffusion chains on average than, than what were observed in face-to-face -face networks, but they're still not that long. So you might see these clusters of hundreds of thousands or millions of nodes, but the average chain length would be something like 15 or 16. Right? Now, that's a pretty long chain, and it's a surprisingly long, long chain. It's a little bit rare to see that. But it's not like I became a fan and all of a sudden I'm able to infect the entire network all at once. It's more like I'm infecting a bunch of people and other people are also kind of partially responsible. And the more weight you get behind starting that cascade, the more likely you are to have a successful, war, uh, successful large set. OK, so another question that we wanted to answer was, can we predict who is? Um, who is influential here? And the answer, if you sift through all of these numbers and read and understand them, the answer is not really, at least not based on the data that we looked at, um, and not in this context. So the only thing that was kind of consistently important was this feed exposure measure, which is essentially a measure of how many people on average saw your stories. This makes sense. If a lot more people see your stories, you're more likely to uh, start a longer chain. But the effect of this variable is very, very small which suggests that it has more to do with kind of a random exposure rather than some inherent property of a person. So yes, if you target really popular people with your advertisements and they spread things out, they just have a broader reach. But in terms of starting the cascade, it really depends on whether they manage to hit one of those pockets of people that are really, really susceptible. And that's a little bit more of a random event. And that's essentially what we discovered here. So in this data, we were essentially able to show that the Facebook newsfeed is enabling these kind of long-lasting chains of diffusion that are longer than what we see in, I, I use real life and I hate to do that as a mistake, but uh, than what we see in face-to-face in -face diffusion chains. Um, we also see that the Facebook network is very connected and so things will spread through the news feed. Uh, and we couldn't actually find any evidence of influentials. Now there are a couple of things here. That doesn't mean that Gladwell is wrong and Watts is right. It means that within this context we could not find the influentials and our results suggest that Watts' model is a better fit for becoming a follower of a page or liking a page on Facebook. Um, there are a couple of things that might play into that. So for example, uh, it might be the case that it's really easy to follow a page. I just click one button, done. It 
might be the case that these are things where they're already, there's already kind of some kind of latent knowledge about things, right? So if I want to indicate or to follow along with Coca-Cola to see if I can get some discounts on soda, right? I already know about the Coca-Cola company through years of advertising. I might not get that through a diffusion chain, but if it's something new, if we limited it to only things that are kind of new ideas, we might see a little bit more of, a, of an influential <laughs> effect. But in our data, we were not able to isolate that or discover any, any evidence of it. And there's other research that, that kind of supports these same findings in other relatively similar contexts. So the evidence is, is kind of mounting in Watts' favor, but it's, it's not a done deal, and that's sort of the nature of science. One other problem with our study is essentially that all of these things are um, hard to prove causally. So we're saying, yeah, you know, the network is very connected. That's kind of obvious from the descriptive studies. Uh, and we can say that you know, you'll generate these long connected clusters, and that's also very descriptive. But we can't actually say, based on this study, that the newsfeed drives a lot of diffusion, that the newsfeed spreads a lot of information. We can say that we believe that that's the case, because we have some evidence for it. Um, and we actually say it, it enables these things. But we couldn't really prove it, because all we were looking at was behavioral data. And we could only say, well, time A and time B, and these things changed. In order to prove some kind of causal link, you actually have to do a little bit more work. And eventually, that got done. So just recently, Eitan Bakshi, one of our other data scientists, along with uh, his thesis advisor, Lada Adamich at the University of Michigan, and Itamar Rosen and Cameron Marlowe, who are also at Facebook, uh, ran an actual experiment to understand feed distribution. And what he did is he uh, took a subset of users and a subset of links. And he decided that if you're in experimental group A, we will not show you any of these links in your newsfeed. You can see them in other places, but you can't see them in your newsfeed. And if you're in experimental group B, you just get the normal experience. And by comparing these two groups, he could actually measure how much the feed contributed to exposure and to subsequent resharing. So somebody would reshare a link or post the link on Facebook, and if they're not seeing it in their newsfeed, but they're posting it anyway, then that means that they didn't find out about it from newsfeed. And in, the and, and in the control group, they're seeing it in the feed. So any difference between these two groups, we can attribute directly to the feed distribution that we have suppressed. So it's a very solid experimental method. Um, and you can see here that the feed exposure actually multiplies the likelihood of sharing. Now this is, he's got a tie strength thing on the x-axis, which I'll explain in a second. But you can see that if you're, if you're seeing something in your feed from uh, relatively weak ties, you're actually getting a multiplier in your likelihood of sharing it by as much as, as nine times. But Mostly, you're getting sort of a 6 to 7x multiplier in your likelihood of sharing an article if you saw it in your feed versus not. Um, the tie strength bit at the bottom was another interesting thing that, that Eitan, was able to, uh, Eitan was able to measure. Because we have behavioral data about how often people are interacting, we can assign some measure of how strong their ties are. And he was able to show, also using this experimental approach, that people share a lot of content that comes from their weak ties, the people they don't interact with very much. So there's this kind of one hypothesis out there that Cass Sunstein furthered a, a while back and that people have been sort of building on that the internet produces echo chambers and that you only pay attention to the things that your closest friends produce. And what these results show is, is kind of the, the opposite theory is, is at least more likely in the Facebook context that you're actually more likely to share things you, you, for any given item, you're more likely to share it if it's from your strong ties. But you have so many more weak ties that, in aggregate, you're more likely to see and share things from people that you're not very closely connected to. Uh, so that was a finding that he published and presented in a paper just this spring, um, less than a month ago, I think, actually, at the World Wide Web Conference in Lyon. OK, so this is the next section. So are there any questions about the first one? Yes. This is actually a really interesting question. There, there were a lot of different patterns, and some of them were regionally loaded. Um, but you saw most patterns across most regions. And this is, I mean, I think this is partly because there's a lot of expats. At the time, Facebook was open internationally, but some countries were, were not very thoroughly saturated the way they would be today. Um, but the, the interesting thing was that you could actually pick out uh, um, alumni pages pretty easily. They had a very distinctive signature. So alumni of schools tended to sort of, that, that's, that, those kinds of pages tended to diffuse in a, in a particular way. And you'd only see kind of kinks if, they, if something crazy happened, right? So like I, think, I think actually he was looking, and one of the exceptions was Cal, because they, they got out of the Rose Bowl or something like that. And so all of a sudden, everybody's following their page. 
We operationalize strength of tie in a lot of different ways. It kind of depends on the study. Um, this was kind of one plot that I don't even think made it into the final paper for, for this particular piece. So I don't know how exactly he operationalized tie strength. Um, I, I'll be honest, I haven't read the whole paper. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, there are a lot, of different, a lot of different ways that you can do it. Um, you can look at frequency of interaction. You can look at, in some sense, kind of the distribution of your attention. So we, uh, with Aton, I, I did a little bit of work on a paper with Aton and John Kleinberg where we, and Lars Backstrom, where we actually kind of looked at how much attention people were paying to their friends and, and kind of broke that down in aggregate and showed you know, what fraction of your friends you pay attention to, that sort of thing. So you can imagine using that kind of balance of attention. If you're focusing a lot of your attention on one person, if that's consistent from month to month to month, that's probably a stronger tie. Like there, there are all kinds of things like that. OK, so why do people share? Uh, one of the things we like to do at Facebook is start with really simple questions that have really complicated answers. Um, and what I like to do is present them in this way and give you one question and then answer a question that is slightly different, which is what I'm going to do now. Um, so now, why do we care why people share? Well, sharing is at the core of our product. Right? Facebook would be a pretty boring place if nobody ever posted any photos or anything. Um, it just wouldn't be all that engaging. And so. Having an engaged user base, having a product that people actually want to use is dependent on understanding why people share and making sure that we make it as easy as possible for people to share information with their friends, for people to get the information that they need, and really to uh, avoid designing products that, make, that, that add barriers and friction to this process. Uh, so we wanted to know, well, what motivates people to share? Are there things like virtuous feedback cycles that maybe we could encourage that, that would create more sharing and things like that? Uh, things that are natural and organic and not kind of technically determined, but things that we can facilitate via the interface. Now, you can come up with any number of hypotheses, and we came up with three that were, in the root, uh, that were based in psychology and social psychology. And eventually, this turned into a research paper. Um, the people who do our research papers really love the cute titles. Uh, so this was Maura Burke and uh, Cameron Marlowe and I, and I believe Itamar Rosen was involved in this. There were, there were several of us on this paper. We were trying to understand what motivates new users to contribute content to Facebook. And we looked at this through the lens of three different, uh, well, basically three different classes of, of theories, and that generated four different hypotheses. So the first is social learning. And the social learning hypothesis basically says that you learn how to do things by seeing others around you do them. There, that's the simplest way to state it. And so we came up with two, uh, two possible ways of representing that in Facebook. The first one is, again, feed distribution. So if you see people uploading photos in your feed, then we predict that you will be more likely to upload photos at a later time. The second was tagging. And the reasoning for this was that if you're tagged in a photo, it's kind of like you're being called out. And we were expecting that if you were somebody who doesn't really share photos to begin with, and you get tagged in a photo, then you're your likelihood of sharing photos would increase because you're learning, you're getting kind of called out, and they're signaling to you that, hey, you know, you should start uploading some of your pictures on Facebook, that maybe this is what a tag represents. And so our prediction there was that if you're tagged in a photo, you're more likely to share in the future. Your sharing will increase. The second one, and this was uh, the front runner at the start, we all believed that this was going to be the big winner, was feedback. If you post a photo and your friends comment on it and say, hey, this photo is amazing. This is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. That's going to be a really nice experience for you. You're going to want to do it again. This goes all the way back to Skinner. I mean, you can even think about ex psychological experiments that, that involve, involve animals and animal learning. Right? It's just a very simple feedback mechanism. And our hypothesis was that, on balance, the feedback that you receive will be positive, and that will be positive reinforcement. And so we should see an increase in sharing if you receive feedback on something that you shared earlier. And the last thing is what, what I kind of call the narcissist theory, which is that uh, you know you've got an audience. You know they're going to see your stuff, and you want them to see it. And so the more people who will see your stuff, the more likely you are to share in the future. Um, so what did we do? Well, we, we took a mixed methods approach from the start here. So before, we just looked at behavioral data. That was kind of all we could do at the time. Uh, and eventually, there was an experiment that that validated at least some of our results. It was a different study, but it, it validated at least one of our big results. Um, this time, we decided to start with both quantitative and qualitative approaches. So on the qualitative side, we interviewed a bunch of new users, had them come in to campus. Now, this is obviously a bit of a skewed sample because they're all people who can actually physically go to Facebook's offices and talk to us. Um, but at least it gives us some idea and some basic sense of whether or not our hypotheses are correct, whether or not the things that we're seeing in the data make sense based on what people are telling us. 
The quantitative side, we built a linear regression model. And so what we did was we took a sample of, of about 140,000 new users. This was an international sample. It was actually a cohort sample. It was everybody who signed up for Facebook on one particular day um, in 2008. So that was our, sub, our, our sample set. Um, that was the cleaned up sample. It was we threw away everybody who uh, joined and never came back or who joined and um, didn't come back more than, more than one or two days. Uh, Moore ran some separate models on some of these other populations to see if we were biasing our results in this way. It turned out that we weren't, so we just pressed ahead with the 140,000 users who remained engaged with the product over the course of our observation. <laughs> and what we did is we looked at what they did in their first couple of weeks on the site, and then we looked at what they did a month or so later. And we used the behavior in the first time period to predict what, uh, as a predictor for, in the model for how many photos they uploaded in the second time period. So we were able to say, based on the number of photos you uploaded in time one and your interaction with your friends and all these things, you know, here's the correlation with the, the photo, number of photos that you upload in time two. Now the data is all anonymous and aggregated in all of these studies. We're not, you know, we're not looking at individual users or looking at their pictures or anything like that. We're just looking at, at kind of rates of activity. So, so we are definitely a privacy conscious firm. Um, you know, I know that there's always some press around this, but this is something that we do take very, very seriously. Uh, and the, uh, the other thing is that, you know, why photos? Well, partly because photos are engaging. A lot of people use photos. Um, partly because at the time, it might be hard to imagine, but in 2008, photos were one of the few things that you could comment on. You can comment on basically everything on Facebook these days, but that was before we launched that little feedback widget. Um, so the only thing that got reliable numbers of comments really were photos. So for measuring the feedback hypothesis, we were restricted to photos, essentially. And we wanted to have a, a balanced playing field for all the hypotheses, so we just carried photos throughout the analysis. Now, of course, we had to have two partitions of, of new users. Some people just don't upload photos in their first two weeks, and that kind of changes the type of analysis that we can run here. So roughly a third, a little bit over a third of the users were initially engaged with the photos product. And what that meant is that they uploaded at least one photo that was not a profile picture. They uploaded <coughs> several photos, essentially. Um, and the rest of them uploaded one or zero, and those were basically people who uploaded a profile picture and never did anything else with the photos product within their first two weeks. Um, now, there might be some concerns here that only a third of the people uploaded multiple photos, that maybe you're looking at some like, weird sample of people who aren't all that engaged, or maybe there isn't a high enough level of engagement among new users to justify the sample. Um, but these users were actually pretty, pretty active. You know, as you can see, 30% you know, is pretty good for uploading photos. But when you start including things like status updates, platform application installs, how frequently they're interacting uh, with other people's content to the extent that they were able at the time, how frequently they log in, this is actually a pretty active set of people using, using the service. <coughs> Any questions so far about how this was set up? OK. so. What I'm going to do is go through the results one hypothesis at a time. And for the methodological folks amongst you who, who are big on regression models, I want you to imagine in this one, as in the previous one, that a whole lot of controls for things like age and gender and, and country and things like that were actually included in the model. So we had sets of controls that we included to make sure that we weren't just encoding a difference in gender, that maybe you know, women are more or less likely to upload photos than men, or you know, younger people are more likely to upload photos. We, we tried to normalize that out as best we could. So social learning, this was our strongest effect. It turns out that social learning is important. Um, for people who were initially engaged with, photo, with a photos product, if you saw photos in your feed, you were significantly, statistically, more likely to, upload, to increase your photo uploading behavior in the second time period over what you did in the first. Um, a couple of notes about this for these initially engaged newcomers. These are uh, log normalized. So, the intercept change is 10%. That means that you'd upload 10% more photos, but because of the, the normalization, you'd upload 10% more photos every time the number of photos you see in your feed doubles. So if I see one photo, then I might upload one later. If I see two, then I would upload 1.1. If I see four, then I would upload 1.21, you know, and so forth. Um, for less engaged new users, this uh, intercept was, change was a lot smaller, still statist statistically significant. Um, but not nearly as large of an effect. And so this leaves us with, with one question of, you know, are you uploading more photos in the second time period because you saw them? Or are you uploading more photos in the second time period because you are part of a group of people who really like to upload photos? Right? So there's this question of maybe it's, maybe it's a homophily process in the sociology term. 
um, that, that you just hang out with people who like to upload photos, and therefore you also like to upload photos. So it's unclear which, was, uh, which mechanism was, was acting. Now, the qualitative responses gave us a lot more confidence in our interpretation that this is actually a social learning process rather than a homophily process. We can't prove it completely, but at least we have some additional evidence here from the mixed methods. Um, so one person says, you know, my friend had a baby in February and she was posting all of her baby pictures here. And so she sent me direct links to the photos. And as a result of that, she started posting her own maternity photos, pictures of her baby, pictures of herself while she was pregnant. Um, the second thing is not about photos. It's because we weren't asking them what drives photo uploading. We're asking very general questions in the qualitative method that Maura was using. Um, she talked about becoming a fan of something. I see somebody else become a fan. This ties into the previous study of Obama or Bacon or whatever, and then I become a fan of it as well. Again, this is kind of the old language. You would now be talking about liking things, but um, you know, there, there it is. So the second part of uh, the second hypothesis in the social learning segment of this was that tagging would actually influence future behavior, and it would it would act as kind of a call out that if you got tagged in a photo, you'd be more likely to. Uh, to interact with the photos product in the future because you've sort of been, been poked in some sense, and to use another Facebook feature term, but you've, you've been sort of told that tagging is, uh, that photos are, are good to, to use. Um, we found that for people who were already engaged with photos, tagging had absolutely no effect on their behavior, they, at least in terms of uploading more photos. Maybe they tagged more people back, but they, they didn't upload more photos. So we didn't get a strong sense from them. From the newcomers, we did see a pretty substantial uh, change in the intercept. Now, the one thing about tagging is that it's binary. We didn't have a lot of people who had been tagged multiple times, so it was one if you were tagged and zero if not. So you're 7% if you are not engaged with photos, 7% more likely to engage with photos later. Now, the thing is, it's not really clear what this means. This ties very nicely in with the hypothesis that we set up. But again, we don't really know the causal direction of these things, and we also didn't get any additional benefit from looking at the qualitative responses. In fact, um, the qualitative responses suggested basically that people didn't know what tagging did. They didn't understand it. They didn't know what it, what it was all about. So one person says, I'm just assuming that that's like a game of tag. You know, you've tagged me and now I'm it, and so I have to go tag somebody else. Um, I think this person just described the poke feature, but you know, it, is, it is clear that people are confused about what this is supposed to be for. Uh, other people say, you know, why would I tag my family members in photos? We're family. We all know each other. This doesn't make any sense, right? And it's a very reasonable thing, and, and you know, from the perspective of the system, of course, the rest of your friends don't know who these people are, maybe. They might, they might like to know which one of them is your brother. Um, but that's not how people think about ne things necessarily when they're interacting with photos. Um, and the third one is that it's kind of a privacy violation. It feels sort of icky. It's a little bit creepy. Like somebody tags me in a photo, and now my face is labeled. Um, that, you know, these are all signs that people are not entirely comfortable, or at least at that time, we're not entirely comfortable with the concept of tagging. And that when they thought about tagging, they didn't think of it as you know, being singled out and told, hey, I should upload more photos. They thought about it in all of these other ways that were really hard to classify. Um, now, our hypothesis after going through this is that the reason that tagging increases photo uploading behavior for newcomers is still consistent with social learning, but it's a different form of social learning. It's not because I was being singled out and told to upload more photos. It's because I was being introduced to the fact that there is a photos product. If I'm not engaged with the photos product, it might be because I just didn't know it was there. If somebody tags me in a photo, now all of a sudden I see a picture, I see myself in it, I see a way to upload photos, things become a little bit more clear. And so it might be the case that we're looking at something, at a social learning process that is a little bit more about teaching people how to use the technology as opposed to teaching people what is acceptable, which is a little bit more of what we were going for when we were thinking about the social learning hypotheses. Okay, now, the effects of feedback. This was, you know, we, we just kind of assumed going in that this was going to be huge, that, that feedback was, was really the big deal. Um, the thing is that feedback is a little bit sparse. It's not that likely that people received multiple comments or received comments on multiple photos in the time, period, in the time window that we were looking at. Um, so again, we classified this as a binary variable, which means that if you received a comment on a photo that you posted, that was a correlated with a 6% increase in photo uploading in the subsequent time period. Now, of course, here you can see it's not applicable to people who were less engaged because they did not upload any photos and therefore could not receive any feedback. Um, so we're only looking at people who were initially engaged. Uh, now, this, this is not a huge result. This is not a huge effect, especially given that it's coded as a binary variable. Um, but it might be the case that this is dampened somewhat by the fact that we're dealing with people who were already pretty engaged with the photos product. 
it might also be the case that we're just missing a bunch of stuff. So the jury's still out on whether or not feedback is, is kind of the big winner here. And we could probably try to replicate the study with more object types now that we have the comment mechanism and the like button and all that stuff. Uh, and that, that would be a really nice, really nice follow-up to this, um, especially in light of the various qualitative responses that we received, which really strongly suggested that feedback was an important part of the process. They also strongly suggested that we were missing a lot of feedback signals. So we had one person, you know, I like it when people comment on my pictures. I try to comment on my friends' blogs and stuff and comment on, on the stuff that they post because it's nice to know that somebody's, this kind of ties into the audience thing, but it's nice to know that somebody's looking at it. It's nice to receive feedback. But the others talk about how, you know, yeah, I give people feedback on their photos all the time. I just don't do it on Facebook. Um, I send them emails. I send them instant messages. I talk to them in person. I say, hey, I saw that photo. It was great, right? Now, obviously, we can't measure this. We're not like, plugged into people's brains. So we might actually just be missing a lot of the feedback data yeah, yet. Uh, we, we might actually be missing a lot of the feedback data that, that people, that people are, um, are, are engaging in these, these sort of forms of interaction. And that might actually be driving the relatively small result that we discovered. Um, and again, that's something that might change now three years later as we have more comment mechanisms. This feedback on Facebook has become more of a normal thing. Okay. Uh, so we controlled for the size of their friend networks. I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. They were generally not that big because they're new, but they were also not tiny. So a part of the reason that, that you don't receive a huge amount of feedback as a new user is because you're still kind of building out your, your friend graph and everything. Um, and, so that, and that's actually kind of an interesting methodological problem, right? So on the one hand, we, uh, we wanted to look at new users because we wanted a sample that was not polluted by established norms of behavior. Right? We wanted people who really by and large, would not be quite sure exactly what's acceptable on Facebook and might have to go through these kind of learning processes to understand what the new user experience was like. Um, but on the other hand, that means that we actually lose a certain amount of signal that we'd get from, from more established users where they have more friends and they're actually more engaged and, and more interactive with the product. And so the last thing was importance of audience. And this was significant, but the effect was really marginal. So every time you double the audience size, it would be, you know, small increase in the likelihood of uploading photos. Um, audience size was not the same as friend count, but it was closely related to it. It's basically how many people were seeing your photos in the feed or how many people were looking at your photos. Um, you know, so we have this sort of aggregated counts of those things. But it didn't really have much of an effect. Um, and it didn't come up in, apart from people talking about it uh, in conjunction with discussion of feedback, it didn't really come up at all. Nobody talked about how many people are going to see their photos or trying to broadcast their information on Facebook. At the time, particularly back then, when there, there wasn't a means of publicly broadcasting, um, you know, our, our working theory at the time was that, that it's because it's more about one-to-one -one or, or one-to-few interactions than it is about kind of broadcasting and trying to get a, large, get a large audience to see your stuff. So we didn't really find any strong effects of this. But um, you know, another kind of confounding point is, of course, how is the user supposed to know how big the audience is for their photo? We don't surface that information to you as users, and so that means that there's, it's kind of hard to understand the mechanism through which that would impact your behavior, except insofar as it's related to the number of friends that you have. So the summary of the findings from back in 2008. Uh, social learning at that time had the strongest effect. It was more important than feedback. Uh, the reinforcement that we were getting had a lot more to do with norm development, people seeing what their friends were doing and, and interacting in that way. Um, and the audience size, of course, has a, has a very small effect. But the feedback, that minor effect of feedback, was probably not accurate based on what we were seeing in the qualitative responses. And so this is another, another good example of how if you just use one method, you come to some conclusion. But, but if you use another method, it can highlight how, how close you are with, with the conclusions that you're drawing and whether or not you need to really clearly reevaluate them. Any questions before we go to part three? OK. Another simple question. Does the internet make us lonely? So this is a question with a long history in internet terms. Of course, the internet itself does not have a very long history. But um, as far as the internet is concerned, this has been, this has been dating back to MUDs and MOOs and dungeon games in the you know, 70s and 80s. Um, what happens with the internet when you use the internet? Does it make you lonely? What happens to social capital? So there are these debates 
Miller McPherson and Wynne Smith Levin published a piece in uh, either AJS or ASR, one of the so big sociology journals, that said, yeah, the internet, using the internet, really bad for your social capital, it decreases social capital. Uh, this is a disturbing trend, and we should try to understand it in more detail. Uh, Bob Kraut said the same thing with uh, Sarah Kiesler, and then a couple of years later published a paper saying, hey, guess what, we were wrong. Um, and on the side of the internet does not make us lonely, it does not decrease social capital. Also, Nicole Ellison, Cliff Lampy, Chip Steinfeld over at, uh, at Michigan State, Cliff is now at, at Michigan, um, did some research that showed that, that essentially your social capital increases as you use social media. Um, they were looking more at social media than the internet at large, but, but they were still looking at this kind of general question of how, whether or not the internet makes us lonely. Um, and this is, this is Maura again. We're really glad that we have her with us. Uh, working at Facebook because she does some, some really cool stuff. And this was uh, work that grew out of a, um, an internship that she did and then subsequently became her dissertation. And so this is kind of in the middle section. So first she did one study, she did this one in the middle and extended this into a full, a full PhD thesis. And so the question that she was asking, she was actually asking how does social media affect well-being? Um, but since she used mostly Facebook data for this and since I work at Facebook, I, I took the liberty of for mo in most cases, changing social media to Facebook on the slides. Um, basically, one of the, uh, one of the issues of, of looking at does the internet make us lonely is that you can't really treat the internet as a monolithic thing. And even if you look at social media, you can't treat social media use as a monolithic thing. You can't say, oh, you have an account with this many friends. That means you use social media a lot, and so are you lonelier? Um, because there, there are different ways of using social media. And so what she did was she essentially broke social media usage down into three general components. One is directed communication in the Facebook context. is things like private messages, chat, posting on people's walls. There's passive consumption, reading your news feed, viewing people's profiles, engaging in the content without actually directly interacting with it. So you're not liking things, you're not commenting, you're not interacting with the other person in any way. You're just kind of browsing. In, in old internet terms, you might, you might call that lurking. Um, and the third one is broadcasting in the Facebook context. Again, this is, this is sort of uploading photos or, stat or changing your status update or things that would kind of broadcast out to, uh, to your friends or to a larger set or a smaller set of people um, without necessarily being directed at any, any given individual. The other thing that she did is she broke this down into kind of indi individual components and social media usage. And she looked at how the interaction between individual attributes and your usage of various social media services in, in her kind of theoretical universe, but in the empirical world, usage of Facebook affected your, your social sense of social well-being. Um, and so she was looking at things like communication skill. So whether or not you believe that you are good at talking to people, that's kind of, that, that could have a, an impact on whether or not social media usage helps you feel less lonely, helps you feel better connected to your friends. Um, and also your general self-esteem. So, you know. How good is your self-esteem? How much do you think that you are, are kind of a worthwhile person? These are the sorts of questions that she was asking uh, in the surveys that she ran. And finally, she uh, actually predicted three different outcomes. So she predicted bridging social capital, which is the extent to which you feel plugged in, that you have access to a lot of good sources of information. It's, in some sense, the breadth of your network. So if something happens, how likely am I to find out about it relatively quickly? How many sources do I have for good news? Do I have, um, or bad news even, do I have, uh, if I need to find a job, do I have a lot of people that I can talk to who might have information about the job search for me, right? The second one is bonding social capital. This is kind of the dyadic strength. It's how closely connected do you feel to people? Do you have close friends, really close friends, people that you feel you can trust, people you can, people you can ask to help you out of a tight spot? Those kinds of, those kinds of questions. Um, and that represents sort of the bonding social capital, this notion of closeness. And the last thing is, is loneliness. You know, do you feel lonely? Do you feel like you have a lot of friends? Um, do you feel like your friends, you know, do you feel like your friends are, um, are interested in spending time with you, that, that you're a person that they want to spend time with? And so she can measure loneliness essentially through these surveys and then uh, Use, use them, sorry, use them as the dependent variables in her analysis. Now, of course, these things, uh, you know, social communication skills, self-esteem, notions of social capital and loneliness, we can't measure them through user activity. There's no way for us to look at somebody's Facebook usage and say, oh, this is a lonely person. 
um, you know, you might think you can do that, but, but then it becomes sort of a tautology where we say, oh, well, people who have low friend counts are lonely, and therefore, if you have high friend counts, you're not lonely, and so Facebook is good if you have high friend counts, right? <laughs> um, no, she had to ask people. So she surveyed users, um, and what she did is actually she did an, a longitudinal set of surveys, and the, the response rates were not great. It was pretty difficult for her. We, do, we did not support fully, um, you know, just blasting people with surveys. She had to survey people in the way that any external person would via recruitment through ads. Um, and she did this as, as kind of a joint effort with Facebook and the National Science Foundation, so there were a whole lot of kind of hoops to jump through. Um, but she launched a well-being survey, and her initial uh, survey set was about 1,200 people. Those people gave us permission to link their email addresses in the survey with their uh, Facebook activity patterns, um, and then kind of aggregated all of that together and, and generated the results and then you know, deleted the data subject to all of the human subjects limitations that she was under. Um, she did follow-ups, a second round of surveys, and got 415 responses from them eight months later. And so this gives her essentially a two-panel set where she can predict your loneliness at time two, your social capital at time two, based on various attributes of the individual at time one. Now, the problem, of course, is that, that there's sample bias here. So people who look at ads are more active on Facebook. It kind of makes sense. The more you're on Facebook, the more likely you are to see the ad, the more likely you are to click through on the survey. Um, they're less likely to be American. They're more, act they're more likely to be women. They're a little bit older than most of the people, the people who are filling out surveys. There's always a sample bias when you take a survey, um, especially one that's this small relative to the user population. Uh, and in, in this case, we were able to kind of characterize this pretty effectively based on, on the user behavior data and the user demographic data that we collect. And so she was able to kind of normalize. So as we talk about this, remember that the sample is biased towards a particular set of people. Um, but also remember, wherever possible, she included all of the appropriate controls and was able to, to normalize out a fair amount of the sample bias, if not all of it. Uh, okay, sorry, that somehow got split up into two pieces. Okay, so what she did was she used these longitudinal surveys and she paired them with the server logs. And we did that because the server data can overcome certain limitations of surveys. So over here you see on the x-axis, one of the questions she asked in her surveys was, how much time do you spend on Facebook every day? And so people self-reported something on, on the x-axis here. And on the y-axis is their actual minutes on Facebook per day. So if people were perfectly accurate at measuring their time spent relative to what we believe they're spending on Facebook, you'd see a diagonal line from the bottom left corner up to the top right corner. Um, and what you see instead is this gigantic cloud. Um, people are really bad at estimating how long they spend doing things in general. This is a known problem in, in survey literature. Um, and there are a lot of ways to get at this information that, that involve time diaries and things that are actually pretty labor intensive to collect. Um, in our case, rather than forcing all these people to keep time diaries, which would have been just crazy, um, we just went to the server logs and, and came up with some heuristic for saying that they spent this much time on Facebook. There's a timeout threshold of a few minutes. If you weren't active for a few minutes, then we ended the session and those kind of things. But essentially, we were able to compute how much time do you spend on Facebook per day, and, and we were able to use that based on server logs instead of relying on people's memories to give us the information that we needed. And so what she did was she used the server data for all of her uh, well, all of her independent variables that had to do with Facebook usage, and she only used the survey data for the things that we could not measure based on Facebook usage. So this is just a kind of a laundry list, um, and what she did was she split it into three factors. So essentially she had a factor for directed communication, a factor for passive consumption, and a factor for broadcasting. And these alpha numbers indicate the extent to which the things in blue are related to the thing in black, are related to each other, and therefore belong in the, that category. And so you can see for directed and communication passive consumption, they're, they're very strongly related. For broadcasting, it's okay. It's not, not spectacular, but at least it's okay. Okay, so here are her results. And what she did was she used a lagged dependent variable regression. And what that means is that her dependent variable was bridging social capital, bonding social capital, or loneliness at time two. And all of her predictors were the measurements of everything else at time one, including the original measures. So what she did was she looked at essentially how much bridging social capital do you have relative to the amount that you had at time one? Did that change? So you're actually looking at kind of a difference between the dependent variable from time one and time two. And so out of all of this, essentially the, the most, um, the only significant finding, statistically speaking, was that directed communication, incoming directed communication, had a positive impact on individual sense of bridging social capital, uh, and a negative impact in 
the measurement sense, but actually a positive impact in a sort of intuitive sense on people's loneliness. So people became less lonely and had a stronger sense that they had better bridging, co social, cap bridging social capital. Bonding social capital did not have a significant effect. Now, in the, in the previous study, based on just the first panel data, bonding social capital was really significant. Um, and the question there was, well, do people have stronger sense of bonding social capital because they're using Facebook? Or are they using Facebook more because they have more bonding social capital? They have a stronger sense of that. Um, and this suggests the latter, that if you have a strong sense of bonding social capital, you use Facebook more. Because in the second time period, your bonding social capital doesn't actually change from time one to time two. It remains basically the same. So she also looked at interactions of individuals, how good they feel they are at communicating, uh, how, lonely, how, much, how high their self-esteem is. And you know, I'll focus on bridging social capital. She did this for all three. Uh, the results were only really significant for bridging social capital and loneliness again. Um, and, and so you can see these kind of interactions. And so what calm skill by directed, uh, directed communication is, is essentially that you know, people, you know, whether or not you feel that you have uh, strong communication skills, and whether and what level of directed communication you have. And, and to kind of illustrate uh, these results, you can see that these are, sort of the, uh, these are statistically significant for uh, communication skill by directed communication and by passive consumption. Um, but it's sort of hard to explain with numbers, so we'll just use this little picture to illustrate here. So um, using median splits, she basically separated everybody into four groups. So people with uh, low and high directed communication and low and high bridging social capital. And then she compared their, their sort of changes, uh, or, I'm sorry, low and high directed communication and low and high communication skill. And she compared the bridging social capital uh, over time. So you can see that on, on, this, one, on this side here. Um, and so you can see that it goes up for both groups. Um, that basically the bridging social capital increases for people regardless of their communication skill. Um, but that the effect is maybe slightly stronger for people who feel that they have a lower communication skill. And now for passive consumption, the effect of passive consumption, it turns out that if you feel like you're good at talking to people, passive consumption has absolutely no effect on your personal sense of bridging social capital. But if you feel like you're not good at talking to people, then passive consumption actually has a positive effect on your, on your sense of bridging social capital. That by browsing Facebook, you don't feel like you're good at talking to people and interacting with them, but by browsing Facebook, you feel like you're more able to get the information that, that, that you need. And so you have a better sense of your ability to access information that the people around you might, might possess. Um, she found, I believe, kind of similar results for loneliness, but that is sort of locked up in her dissertation at the moment. So, um, so I'll sort of have to wait until she, she publishes these things. That's, that's essentially, that's the implication. Of course, there are, there are obviously methodological concerns here where you have, um, just as an example, if it, it might, you know, these, these populations were pretty heavily loaded towards people who feel good about themselves, um, the people who were responding to this survey. And so this is sort of all relative. It might very well be the case that once you get below a certain threshold, like Facebook's really bad or something, or Facebook's really good, but, but you know, even better, like who knows. So we don't have that kind of set. It's, it's sort of hard to fathom intuitively that that this would necessarily be bad for them, but, but you do have these kind of weird effects where like, if you're, not, if you're really on the low end of that spectrum, you might be doing things that are actually actively antisocial, and the result is that you sort of alienate your friends when you start using social media. This was something, this was something that, that Moore was actually really interested in, uh, understanding, that was kind of the impetus for this project, is that uh, she wanted to know for people with, um, with things like Asperger's syndrome, she's, she's actually done some work on Asperger's syndrome and internet usage and found some really interesting things about essentially how the internet and how social media kind of moderates different senses of social norms and how certain types of norm transmission are much more effective when they're mediated through online communication, whereas others you really need to kind of have personal interaction and direct intervention. Uh, so the, as a summary, just to summarize, so it's not enough to have a high friend count in social media. You need to interact with people. So Facebook is good for you uh, in some sense is, is sort of the message that, that Moore took away from this. But it's only good for you if you're using it in kind of certain ways. If you're just adding a lot of friends and not actually engaging with it, it's not going to have any effect. That kind of makes intuitive sense. If you're not using the service really, then how can it impact your sense of self-worth or your sense of social capital? Um, the benefits can include uh, bridging social capital, decreases in loneliness. So you, you feel like you're more connected broadly to the world and information out there, but you're, and you're not as lonely. Um, and that they primarily 
come from receiving interactions. Again, this makes intuitive sense. If you think about it, if, if I post a lot of status updates and nobody ever comments on it, that's really not going to make me less lonely. Um, but if I'm receiving comments and people are sending me messages, then I feel more connected to the world. I'm actually getting some input from people, and that's a, that's a really nice thing. Um, and the last thing is passive consumption is only really beneficial for those with a lower communication skill and lower self-esteem. So if you're just cruising through Facebook and you already have a good sense that you're good at talking to people, you're a people person, that's not going to have much of an impact on you. But if you're somebody who kind of struggles to relate to people, uh, self-identifies in that way, um, at least down to the, where we were able to measure, uh, it seems that Facebook actually provides a much stronger benefit and, and it provides some benefit even if all you're doing is passively consuming and reading your feed. So I don't know if this is based on research so much as personal experience, but, uh, but um, you know, when I started working at Facebook, I very quickly moved into this world of, of um, basically software engineers that I had not inhabited in the past. And so learning all these new technical skills and learning about all these new technical tools, and I started finding myself commenting and posting a lot about stuff that had everything to do with programming and nothing to do with the rest of my life. Um, and you know, I got a lot of good positive feedback on that from a very specific subset of my, of my friends. And so I, I think that what I realized after a certain amount of time when, um, I think it was actually my wife, was just like, I don't understand any of your status updates anymore. <laughs> um, so I realized that actually that you, you kind of have to be mindful of the audience. And we have a lot of tools that allow you to do that. So you can now target your posts to subsets of your friend list. You can do, uh, you can use groups for things that, that are interest-based. You can use messaging. It's, it's pretty good actually for, for multiple people on one thread. Um, and the messenger product, particularly if you're, um, particularly if that set of people is relatively small, uh, like four or five, ten people. So, I think the advice that I would have is to try to try to focus, try to find a way to use the product that works for you, so that's convenient, but also works for the people that you're interacting with. Because this is a communication medium; it is something that you use to, to talk to each other, um, and so. You, you might want to avoid like having very public conversations with people about private information, things of that nature. This is something that I think, for me, was not a problem because I, I learned about the internet in a time when everything was public and you never said anything there unless you really wanted people to know about it. Um, but I think, I think as people are coming up right now, um, we want people to be open, we want people to share, but we want them to be able to share in ways that, that are comfortable or within their control. And so kind of educate yourself about the tools, whether it's within Facebook or across different platforms. Uh, learn how to use them to the, the most effective way possible, and then that way you'll run into fewer problems and you'll actually have a much better experience. Um, and it's our job, essentially, on the, on the Facebook side, to make it as easy as possible for you to figure out how to do those things. Um, and to the extent that we're able to do that, you know, that's, that sort of, in some sense, dictates how successful we'll be. Great. Well, thank you all very much for coming. And thank you for